Okay. Hey Gabsters. How are you Gabsters doing? I hope you guys are having a great day. Um, it's Wednesday today and yeah. Um, so I promised you guys Fismas 4 videos every day until Fismas 4 ends and I haven't actually kept up with my promise. Excuse me, I do apologize for that. Um, there's just been a lot of stuff that's been happening and I actually haven't been like present at the Fismas for I've just been keeping track of it online and you know just yeah that's what I've been doing but um, today um, the we had representatives of the SRC come and um, speak to the students at and it was really good because it was it I mean, a lot of the time when you go up there for the meetings and there's a lot of students, you, you usually can't hear, um, sorry, there's something in my eye, you usually can't hear what they're saying or, um, you know, maybe you get intimidated because it's such a big crowd and maybe you feel like everybody's too politically minded, you know, like you, you check yourself, you know, you're like, yo, you know, and it was really nice because it just gave space for, um, everyone to voice their concerns and to ask questions and those kinds of things um, and they raised some serious issues with you know in terms of um, you know what students I mean students raise some serious um, questions concerns and potentially also um, gave input for way forwards and contingency plans and things like that that was fantastic but the reason why I'm here, Gaps, is because I promised you a how are we actually going to fund FISMAS 4? Like, practically speaking, how are we going to fund it? Now, one of the things that um, they did say was that they are actually in the process of coming up with said practical plan that they're going to... Um, sorry. That they're going to... Um, Give to government? What do you? What, oh Lord! They're, they're gonna give to government and um, basically be like, you know, it's possible, and this is how you can do it. You know, as an alternative for basically, you know, as an alternative to we don't have the money. But um, I can give you a breakdown of some of the arguments that I have heard concerning FISMAS for, and those arguments. Include are all are arguments that actually work together. So not one argument is the solution, but they are all linked in one way or another, and are all linked with either a change in the um, economic policy of South Africa, or a part of a decolonizing either um, university institutions as well as just decolonizing. Um, education and knowledge and you know the spaces that we live in so I'll start off with the economic um, arguments first and then move to the um, decolonization argument okay I've written them down we've got um, six I believe six arguments the first argument is a, the first argument is basically an argument for to government that they need to stop mismanaging funds. If we look at the amounts of money that actually go into, um, for example, state ba bailouts of parastatal companies and those kinds of things, there is so much money there that like, we're talking like hundreds, we're talking about billions of rands, not hundreds of millions, like billions of rands that go in and to bail out um, parastatal companies and all due to mismanagement and corruption of funds. <clears throat> so, argument number one, just manage your money. Watch your pockets, watch your bank accounts, and then you'll be good. The second argument um, goes towards um, wealth tax and basically um, finding ways to redistribute and close the gaps between the very rich and the very poor. Because what is happening right now is that the economic system is such that it replicates itself in creating more distance between rich and poor so the rich are getting richer the poor are getting poorer and you have like a very small middle class that you know poor people say oh you know one day I can 
the middle class. And then the rich people say, ah, oh, but it's not so bad because you have a middle class. But the truth of the matter is that that middle class is small. And it's not going to get bigger because of the economic system in which we are in. The economic system that we are in replicates um, continued disparities between rich and poor. It needs to have a pool of um, poor people in order for it to be able to sustain itself. So, for instance, we all talk about, um, you know, there's a big unemployment pro problem in South Africa. It's not a problem that doesn't actually have a place within the economic system. You need you need the big, um, you know, pool of poor people so that you can have a pool to choose from so that you can pay the kinds of salaries, the slave salaries that you are paying to people and people will have no choice but to accept them. You know, it's not a legislation problem that we have. We have great legis labor legislation here in South Africa, but it's the system itself, the economic system which we have and are pursuing is one that is unsustainable and will continue to create the distances between the rich and the poor. So rich tax, wealth tax, whatever, is one of the ways in which you can actually try to close those gaps between um, the redistribution, the gap between rich and poor. And I know that we always say that, oh, but I work so hard, especially the middle class, because they actually did work hard to get to where they are, particularly um, black middle class, which has been the growing middle class. Um, you know, black people were previously disadvantaged in this country. So when you see a middle class black person, chances are they work their asses off to get to where they are, right? And I'm not taking that away from them. But in truth is, not everybody gets to make it in this economic system. I hear banging doors. How many times have you read a newspaper article or on Facebook, um, 7A marks, that they didn't get NISFAS, which is the main government funding body bursary loan scheme, it's a loan scheme, the main government loan scheme that um, particularly undergraduate students use to pay for their education. Um, there are other government funding um, schemes and things like that, but the main one, the main one is NISFAS, and NISFAS doesn't cater for all students, it's got limited funding, so not every student that fulfills the criteria will, is guaranteed to get NISFAS. And even if you do get NISFAS, you might not get the full amount. You could get 10% of funding, 20% of funding, it depends on, you know, depends on NISFAS. So, how many times have you watched um, a clip on YouTube, a clip on um, Facebook, I read the paper about a student who got seven A's and is not at university, or university students who've got degrees upon degrees yet are not getting employed. We, this millennial generation, is the highest educated, is the most educated generation of all time. We have the most degrees out of most people, yet we are the most unemployed and the most underpaid you know, we have the most precarious, even if we are employed, chances are it's precarious labor, it's like short term here, short term there, short term there. Why are we having these economic, and this is not just in South Africa, by the way, like, I hear banging doors, and I don't know what the heck's going on. Okay. Okay, so wealth tax, that's the second one. The third one has to do with bringing back the land, um, the bringing back the land argument is basically based on the fact that um, it's got two breaches, which is going to be my next point. The first point is that, um, firstly, um, wealth in South Africa is is racially is usually racially um, determined. So white people are poor, black people are, I mean, excuse me, white people are rich, black people are poor, right? Um, White people are rich because they have been historically benefiting, historically even prior to independence, during apartheid, have been historically um, benefiting from apartheid laws and continue to benefit because those laws economically, we did change the political system, but the economy of the country basically has stayed in white hands and poor people continue to be poor. So, by bringing back the land, the idea is that 
that money that is now currently staying in white hands, or staying in the same hands that it's always been in, will get redistributed to the rest of the country. The second argument is that how can you actually trust somebody who benefited during apartheid to now wake up and all of a sudden care about you? You, who they didn't care about, they didn't care for prior to 94. The change of laws doesn't mean a change in the, in the heart. Um, truthfully speaking. And also, why would somebody who didn't care during apartheid care now at the cost of their own wealth? Because now you're saying, you know, put your wealth on the line and show me that you care. And they don't have to do that. So why would they? Linked to bringing back the land is also um, companies having to, um, particularly foreign companies, which is the majority of the major industries in this country are run by foreign companies. Um, if you look at retail, if you look at um, manufacturing, if you, most of the industries in this country are actually run by foreign companies. Even mining, one of our biggest um, sectors in this country, is potentially the only sector where we benefit really is in agriculture, which is again run by white people but it's white Afrikaner farmers so again different history there but um, generally most industry is run by foreign companies in South Africa. Now those foreign companies don't have a responsibility to reinvest their profits back into the country so whatever profits that they make they, get, they can take out of the country and do whatever it is that they please with. This is highly unacceptable because Basically, you just come here to take our money. The industry is such that South Africa is a consumerist um, country. We have more imports than we have exports, and even the things that we do export are not finished products. We're still exporting um, primary source, primary goods, and they go out of the country. They get valued up. They get processed into final products. They add value to them and then they bring them back and sell them back to us at like exorbitant prices. If you look at the mining industry, which is one of our biggest industries, and um, platinum, why aren't we making platinum rings here, platinum necklaces here, diamond necklaces here? Eh? Why are we not cutting diamonds here? Why must the diamonds go over there to get cut and come back at exorbitant prices? Okay, yes. So companies reinvesting back into the country. So companies don't have a responsibility to reinvest back in the country. And I know people say, yeah, but we have CSR, CSI programs, which is the so corporate social investment, corporate social responsibility and all of that. But um, that money is a tax write-off. They don't lose any money by engaging in CSI and CSR and what, 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 what. It gets written off as tax. Firstly, so it doesn't matter, and it's such a small portion that it's not even a dent. It doesn't even go into their profits. This is like money, spare money that these companies have. Okay, and I'm making it seem like it's spare money, spare change, but you know what I mean. They make so much money compared to what they actually put in the CSR, CSI programs that it's actually not. Um, it's not. It, it, it doesn't make a dent into the problems that we have, you know, like, you know what I mean? It's like literally a drop in the ocean. So that is a problem. And um, CSI programs have been shown to be flops for various reasons, but they generally don't work. And we need to find investments, rein we need to reinvest in real quantifiable, impactful ways and not just, you know, Let's do something quick, quick, quick and put a bandage over a seeping wound, which is currently what is happening right now. And then the last one really sort of has to do with, you know, changing the ways in which we think about what is education, what is knowledge, um, you know, the idea of formal education, like, okay, uh, yeah, now this is me now, huh? So I say, you know, universities have so much knowledge in them. We come here to teach kids to be doctors, to be engineers, to be construction workers, to be architects, to be social scientists, to be... But 
you leave university and the first problem you usually have is experience, lack of experience, therefore you can't get a job. But we've already discussed that you can't get a job because the system won't let you. But I mean, one of the main reasons they give is that um, you don't have experience, right? I don't understand how a university like we have is not, with all the departments that they have and all the knowledge that they have, is not actually investing in making itself self-sustainable. So why aren't we using solar paneling? Why aren't we um, farming our own food that we're going to use in the dining halls to feed students? Why are we outsourcing the cooking, the cleaning, the catering, the dining halls, all of these malls, when it could actually be students that are working here and helping pay off the free education? Like, we are not... We're, again, going back to the economic system that we're following, these ideas of outsourcing and all of those things, it is possible to put university students into practical programs that add value to the courses that they're doing, but also add value to the university itself, and also creates a population of people that are not just me-centered, but are we-centered. Imagine if you child comes to university and you know is thinking about oh you know what actually I need to think about ways of how to save my residents um, money and then they come up with a project and your child now is like running projects at university like I mean just think about that like think about the potential that is there but we're not tapping into it because for some reason we and this is the way now I go off, but for some reason we place, and I'm not saying that the, the space for thinking and whatever is, is um, you know, that it's far-fetched, but we are so driven to like following models of education, like we want to be Cambridge, right? But we can't, we can have Cambridge quality standard of education, but why are we cop copying and pasting Cam Cambridge here? Why aren't we creating a university that works for us here, at the same time providing the kinds of knowledge that you could find anywhere in a world-class society? I mean, WITS has the lecturers. It's not like it doesn't have the lecturers. Right now we have the lecturers. We are a leading university in this world, globally. In Africa, <coughs> top leading. Globally, we're somewhere there. But leading universities, we are known all over the world. You know? And I don't understand how... The brains and the and the and the hands between students, lecturers, and everybody else. This university should not be asking anyone for anything. And I understand it's going to cost potentially the initial investment in creating that kind of university is going to be great. But why not do it? Why not do it? Are we saying that one kind of knowledge is better than another kind of knowledge? Or, no, we don't want to turn this university into a technicon. I mean, we need to think about what we consider to be knowledge. And are we colonized in our conceptions of what is knowledge, what is a good university, what is a bad university? Because we're making these things according to what we think is good and bad. But these good and bad notions are notions that are taken from somewhere else and then forced upon us to make us believe that if we don't meet this standard then somehow we are worse off than other people a balance between formal education and education that allows people to leave and be able to do things themselves we don't place priority in this country on for instance technicons and those kinds of things like we think that it's lower it's what 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 and even this distinction between a technicon and a university for me honestly i just don't get it because at the end of the day learning how to think, you're learning how to do, and you're supposed to put those things into practice. Hmm? One's learning how to do, the other one's learning how to think, and neither of them ever speak to each other. Anyway, Gapster, so those have been the arguments that have been laid out. Should I find out or get the proposed plan that the Fees Must Fall uh, movement is putting forward to government um, in the next couple of days? I will be putting it in the description box of this video as soon as I get it so just keep on clicking on here until I get a hold of it I know it's only happening potentially next week so from next week onwards you can start looking for that link I'm sure I'll have it by then once it's been delivered to government thank you so much for watching Gapsters bye